I'll never forget a young man who came to me after church one day, obviously bothered by something that was really eating him. Pastor, he said, if God is so real, then why in the world do people have to suffer so much? His voice shook. A tear started to form in the corner of his eye. And with that, he asked one of the most important questions in the universe. In fact, I'll bet you've asked this question too. So stick around because today we're going to meet it head on. It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Sean Boonstra. One day, a kindergarten teacher gave her students a simple assignment. Take some crayons and draw a picture. Now, most of the kids did what you'd expect them to do. They drew simple stick pictures of families, houses, and animals, and most of them were done in about 10 minutes. But one little girl kept on drawing very ardently long after the other kids were finished. Would you like to tell me about your picture? I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, honey, no one knows what God looks like. They will after I draw my picture. Well, we smile when we hear a story like that because the world seems so black and white for little kids. But when we grow up and have to face some of the ugly realities of human life, the answers don't always come so quickly. We might think we know what God looks like when we're little, but the more of life we experience, the less certain we become. When we're little, we hear that God is loving and powerful and good. But when we grow up, we experience things that make us really wonder if it's true. We see a child abduction in America, a genocidal rampage in Rwanda, a war in Yugoslavia, and, and the natural question is to ask why God would allow these things to happen when He's supposed to be able to stop them. Is it possible that He's not really powerful enough to actually do something? Or is the problem that God just doesn't care? Well, according to the story given in the Bible, neither of these things is true. All of the evidence presented in the pages of God's book suggests that God really is all-powerful and that He really does care. So then, how in the world do we explain the fact that life on planet Earth has so much pain? Philosophers describe this as the problem of evil. And the question kind of runs like this. If God is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-loving, why then do we still have evil in the world? In other words, if God can do something about this, you think He would. And try as they might, over the last few thousand years, nobody seems to have come up with a really good answer, with one rather remarkable exception. Philosophers have failed to answer it. Great leaders have failed to answer it. Scientists have failed to answer it. But that doesn't mean there isn't an answer. If people would only take the time to read what God Himself says, they'd be absolutely stunned by what they hear there really is an answer to the problem of evil. You know, one of the things I, I really like about the Bible is that it's about the most honest book you're ever going to find. I know that some people dismiss this book as a bit of Judeo-Christian propaganda, but usually that's because they've never actually read it. Time and time again, when somebody tells me that the Bible is just a book full of wishful thinking, written by people trying to promote their own way of life, I ask them this one simple question. Have you ever actually read it? And you know, almost every time, Dollars to Donuts says they haven't. In fact, nobody who's read the Bible seriously would ever say those things because as a work of national propaganda, the Bible pretty much fails. You see, instead of singing the praises of God's people, it actually lays out the realities of human life in all the gory details. It never tries to cover up the sins of God's own people and make them look better than they really were like those old Victorian paintings that covered up the obvious blemishes on a member of the royal family. In fact, quite the opposite is true. The Bible is harder on God's own people than you might expect. And, and you know there's a good reason for that. The Bible is more interested in truth than propaganda. 
In the New Testament, we read that the stories we find throughout the pages of this book were written as an example for you and me, a sort of warning about where life can go if you're not paying attention to the solid warnings that God gives us to have a better life. It tells us that Noah got drunk so that you and I can see what happens when we willingly sacrifice our sobriety. It tells us that Abraham lied so that you and I can see what kinds of trouble start when you lie. It tells us that David murdered and committed adultery so that we can see how it ruined his family without having to learn it the hard way. God wants you to see the ugly truth about human life so that maybe, just maybe, He can spare you some of the heartache that comes with a life of sin. But in addition to that, the Bible is also telling us another story. It pulls back the curtains of the universe and lets us see what's going on behind the scenes, giving us reasonable answers to some of life's toughest questions. Let me show you what I mean in a passage found in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Listen to this. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now, now I hope you were paying close attention because that passage was really important. It tells us that the first place war broke out was not between neighboring tribes of cavemen or the battlefields of ancient civilizations. War is a problem that actually started in the kingdom of heaven. And if you think that through a little bit, that means heaven suffered before any of us did. So we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God has not somehow isolated himself from the problems in the universe in some place where he just doesn't have to deal with it. Back in the 18th century, people were toying with a theory known as deism, which taught that God is some sort of an absentee landlord who started the whole planet in motion, but then he went on a vacation, leaving us to fend for ourselves. According to the deists, God created the universe, but he certainly doesn't answer prayers or intervene in our personal lives. The Bible, though, makes it crystal clear that's not true, not, not even a little bit. God is not living in an isolation chamber where he doesn't have to live with the effects of evil or pain or suffering. God is completely familiar with those things, and furthermore, the Bible says he's chosen to do something about it. Just listen to this. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, wait a minute. That's what God did? He just kicked the devil out of heaven? What kind of solution is that? I mean, if I were God, I would have been done with it and just wiped the devil out of existence. And then the devil's gone and the problem's solved, right? Well, maybe. Let's think about this for a moment. Let's suppose that you really are in charge of the kingdom of heaven and one of the angels is acting up. Would you really solve the problem by wiping him out? might seem like a good solution, but apply that same principle to your own children, and I think you'll start to see there's a problem. Let's suppose you have a dozen kids, and one of them begins to challenge your authority in front of the other children. And to make matters worse, some of the other kids are starting to think, well, maybe he's right. What are you as the father going to do? D do you take the rebellious boy out behind the house and have him shot? <laughs> you might be tempted to, but of course you'll never do it because it might bring short-term relief, but in the long run, that's going to cause some big problems. There's no question your surviving children are going to be very obedient if their older brother is dead, but now their obedience has nothing to do with love and respect. They're just obeying you because they're suddenly terrified of what you might do to them if they don't. And when that happens, you don't have a family anymore. You have a concentration camp, a reform school for kids, a prison where the inmates can't wait to turn 18 years old, get a job, and get out of the house. Well, according to the information revealed in the Bible, the problem God faced with Lucifer was something like that. All of the angels had been created with the freedom to choose, because if you think about it, without a choice, you can't really choose to love. Unless you're free to walk away, you aren't really staying there out of your own free will. And so, because God is a God of love, He created a universe where genuine, loving relationships are real. 
where, where people and angels had the freedom to choose. And frankly, that's the reason we all crave meaningful relationships even to this day. And just turn on the radio sometime and you'll see what I mean. A vast majority of the songs that make it into the top 40 are about one of three things. Falling in love, falling out of love, or wishing you could be in love. We all crave a meaningful relationship with something or someone outside of ourselves because it makes us feel more complete. And the reason we crave it is because we've been wired that way by God Himself, and He describes Himself as a God of love. We were created in the image of God with the freedom to engage someone else in a meaningful relationship that makes us something more than we were without them. But without a choice, you can't have a real relationship. It becomes a jailer-prisoner relationship instead of something that brings more joy to either one of you. It's a boss-employee relationship, a master-slave relationship, but not a meaningful personal relationship. And that's the reason it was possible for an angel to turn his back on God. It was a risk that God was willing to take in order to create a universe filled with meaning and joy. Just ask any parent why they choose to have a baby when there are so many risks involved. Why have kids when one of them might break your heart and go to jail? Why start a family when in spite of your best efforts to build a good relationship, your child might choose to move away and never speak to you again? Why bring children into this world when they might, in spite of our best efforts to teach them, become a problem to the rest of society? The answer is simple. It's worth the risk in order to have a meaningful relationship with your kids. Now, tuck that information behind one ear and listen to what the Bible says happened in the courts of heaven as one of the angels decided to turn his back on God. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High." This is really a startling backstage peek at the nature of sin and suffering. The problem started when one angel suddenly began to think that he was better than God Himself. And he launched a malicious campaign to seize the throne of the universe. It was an attempted coup. Fueled by a hateful propaganda campaign, a corrupted angel started to spread lies around the kingdom of heaven, suggesting that something was wrong with the government of God. And it's at that point that we find God removing the devil from the kingdom of heaven. And it's important to understand at this point that God didn't create a devil. He discovered one after Lucifer chose of his own free will to turn away. In fact, in Ezekiel 28 verse 15, God says that Lucifer was perfect until iniquity was found in him. It wasn't God's fault, and at that point, the fallen angel had to go. Which brings us back to the really big question. Why just kick the devil out? Wouldn't it have been easier to just destroy him? No question about it. It might have been easier, but God doesn't usually do what's easy like we do. He usually does what's best. If God had just stomped out Lucifer, what would the other angels think? Don't forget that the rebellion Lucifer caused was pretty widespread. Many Bible scholars are convinced, according to a passage found in Revelation chapter 12, that about one-third of all the heavenly angels had to be kicked out. That means Lucifer had a pretty big audience. And if he were suddenly killed, you got to wonder what the rest of them would think. Maybe Lucifer was right. Maybe there is something wrong with the government of God. A after all, he just wiped out Lucifer like he was scared of something. Now, of course, we could argue that God could just kill the devil and make an announcement and that should put an end to it, but that's not the way God works. Don't forget, God didn't kill you the minute you started to make trouble in this world, and there's a reason for that. He's a God of love, and even though Lucifer turned out to be a hopeless case, he still doesn't want to rule the universe like a ruthless despot. A God of love doesn't want to rule with fear and intimidation. In His wisdom, He decided to bring the entire universe along for an experience that would guarantee that we never sinned again 
and at the same time not violate the free will that allows us to truly love. It's as if God said to the devil, listen, here's the plan. I'm going to let you run your program for a while so that everybody can see for themselves why I told them that following me is a better way to live. Satan, do your best. Go build your kingdom, and I'll let the whole universe see where your kind of sinful pride really goes. In the end, we'll let the people decide who's telling the truth. That's the reason. When Jesus came to earth, he talked about showing the world his Father's name. You see, in the Bible, names are more than just labels you stick on people. Names in the Bible actually tell you something about a person's character. So listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 17, right in the middle of an intimate conversation between God the Son and God the Father. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. What does Jesus mean when he says he showed God's name to the disciples? Well, it means he showed them the character of God. When you look at Jesus, you get to see God himself. And all of a sudden, as you study the person of Christ, you start to understand that somebody's been lying to us about what God is like. He's not arbitrary or harsh or severe. He's not an isolationist who doesn't care about us. In the person of Jesus, we get to see the truth. God is love. So why would a God of love allow us to suffer as much as we do? Well, God's got an awful task ahead of him, one I'm glad that I don't have to solve. How in the world do you keep our freedoms intact, eliminate sin and suffering, and at the same time create an ironclad guarantee that this kind of problem is never going to happen again? Well, as it turns out, God's got it all figured out. If he allows sin to run its course just long enough that none of us has any doubt that it's the wrong way to go, then he knows we're never going to do it again. I don't know about you, but given a choice between a perfect world and this place, I don't think I'm ever going to pick this place again. Do you see what I'm driving at? Sometimes you have to let people find out for themselves that you're telling the truth. I remember as a kid that it just wasn't cool to wear a toque to school. Now, in America, nobody really knows what a toque is because you call it a stocking cap. But in Canada, we call it a toque. And above all else, it just wasn't cool to wear a toque because by the time you got to school, you had a bad case of toque head. Your hair was all matted and sweaty from wearing it. And besides that, if you were really tough, there's no way you'd ever wear the thing because tough guys don't need warm clothes in winter. So even when my mother made me wear that stupid thing, I pulled it off the minute I got down the street and around the corner. And sometimes to be really tough, I even pulled off my gloves and heavy winter coat even when it was 15 or 20 degrees below zero. Well, one winter I had this really bad cold, and my mother told me that if I didn't dress warmly on the way to school, I was going to get sick, even more sick than I was, and maybe even develop pneumonia. So, of course, being the tough guy I thought I was, I completely ignored her advice, and a few days later I made a remarkable discovery. My mom was absolutely right. I developed pneumonia, and I got really sick. Now, here's my point. Sometimes, when you have your hands full with stubborn, rebellious kids, you got to let them find out the hard way before they're going to believe you. And once the poison of rebellion had infected God's universe, he knew that the best way to put an end to the problem forever was to let us find out for ourselves. Don't forget, God didn't choose sin for us. We did that all by ourselves. When we decided that we didn't want to follow his advice or live by his rules, and we chose instead to follow another path, God decided to let us find out exactly where that path goes. And today, we live in a world full of pain and suffering. We have a world where we can see what hatred does to people. We have a world where we can see exactly why God told us not to murder or steal. And when this life is over, and we finally stand in the kingdom of God, He's not going to have to take away our freedom of choice to solve the sin problem because from that moment on, we're going to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that when God laid out the best plan for our lives, He really did know what He was talking about. And that brings me to the thing I really want you to think about. When your life is getting tough and you want to shake your fist at heaven, you've got to ask the question why you're assuming that God is at fault. Is it possible that you have the wrong guy?
Is it possible that the dragon who whispers in your ear that God is at fault is the real culprit? In the book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12, it says this, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. You see, when the devil got kicked out of heaven, he didn't give up. Instead, he managed to convince a whole bunch of us to join his rebellion, and now he works full time to keep us completely in the dark. So do you see it? We've been shaking our fist in the wrong direction. It's like a kid who discovers that his father, who has custody, has been lying to him about his mother for all these years. His mother didn't really leave the house and abandon them. Instead, the father ran out in the middle of the night taking the kids. We've been lied to. Our Heavenly Father isn't doing this. The devil is, and it's high time we started shaking our fist in the right direction. After all, in a heartbeat, according to the Bible, it's all going to be over, and you'll be home with God. So the decision right now is yours to make. Where does your heart belong? Who's been telling you the truth? C can you trust what this book says? You better believe it. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all Thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. Would you like to trust that somebody's really in control of this universe? Why don't we pray together? He Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. As we look at the cross of Christ, we can see who you really are, a God of love who laid his own life on the line to save us. Open our eyes so that we can see what you're doing for us and take us safely to heaven through the grace of Jesus Christ. We ask in his precious name, amen. 
Have you ever pledged to read the whole Bible only to give up halfway through the book of Leviticus? Or perhaps you've gotten in late after work, opened your Bible, and fallen asleep while you're reading. Even worse, maybe you've spent a lot of time reading, but you don't seem to get much out of it. Well, if it's happened to you, don't feel too badly, because it's happened to millions of people. We have just the thing for you. It's a little Bible study guide written by Sean called The Sword of the Spirit. Inside, you'll find practical tips to help you get more out of your Bible. Plus, it will help you to remember what you've learned. Also included are easy to follow Bible reading plans to help you study the entire Bible and develop that all important sense of biblical context without starting in Genesis and reading straight through to Revelation. To obtain your copy, here's the information you need. To receive your free copy of the book, The Sword of the Spirit, please call our toll free number at 1 800 253 3000. Call right now. Lines are open 24 hours daily. They may be busy, so keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number. Ask for the book, The Sword of the Spirit. You may also request today's offer by writing to, it is written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91359. This offer is available for an address in North America only. The Sword of the Spirit is also available on our website, itiswritten.com, where you will also find a host of additional spiritual resources. Plus, there's an archive of scripts and programs you can watch online. Better yet, sign up for Sean Boonstra's weekly podcast. It's all waiting for you at itiswritten.com. It is Written is a faith-based outreach made possible by viewers like you. Thank you for your letters and your continued support. Our toll-free number is 1-800-253-3000 and our web address, itiswritten.com. Discover answers to the most common questions of life at BibleInfo.com. That's right, answers to questions directly from God's Word, the Bible. BibleInfo.com is used by people around the world. It's available in 19 languages. Easy and simple to use, BibleInfo.com answers to life's questions. Log on today and discover the answer you've been looking for, BibleInfo.com. You know, It Is Written has been on the air every single week for more than 50 years. And now, it's all about to change. No, not because we're pulling the weekly show off the air, but because we're adding a daily program that's going to air every single workday, Monday through Friday. The, the whole idea is that every day you get one passage from the Bible, not only to help you through your day, but to give you the tools you need to build a better life. And where can you see this new daily program? It's right in front of you on your computer screen if you go to itiswritten.com. Itiswritten.com. And I'll see you there tomorrow. The creation evolution debate has been raging for decades. At its core are some of the biggest questions in the universe. Does God exist? Where do human beings come from? What story does the fossil record tell? What is the meaning of life? Pastor Sean Boonstra focused on these basic questions in a recent series called Out of Thin Air, which is now available as a two-disc DVD set. Included are four inspiring presentations by Pastor Boonstra, plus three insightful interviews with biologist Dr. Timothy Standish. Topics include The Big Question. Ancient writings tell the story of an omnipotent God who brought this universe into existence. Yet some ask, does he really exist? The hidden history of the human race. Evidence seems to suggest that our ancient past might be different than what we've believed for generations. Is this true? Secrets in stone. The more we dig into the earth, the more surprises we find. What happened to this planet in the distant past? Out of thin air. Amazingly, there are reliable answers to the most important questions ever asked. Discover why you are here. In addition to the DVD series, Pastor Boonstra has written a dynamic book on this important subject, also titled Out of Thin Air. The book delves deeper into the vital issues surrounding the creation evolution debate. To order, please call 1-800-253-3000 or visit itiswritten.com. The DVD is $19.95 and the book $9.95. But for a limited time, you can get both the book and the DVD for a special discount of just $25.
Discover why this subject is so important and how it forms the basis of meaning and purpose in your life. Call today, 1-800-253-3000 or visit itiswritten.com. This week, come meet me at my website, itiswritten.com. And remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.